On this Wednesday night, Taiwan's worst earthquake in decades. A Canadian caught in the disaster and what prevented it from being worse. The former federal conservative leader weighs in on foreign interference. Why he believes China meddled in Canada's 2021 election. I think a lot of people did not vote because they, they were intimidated. Making a dent in Canada's auto theft crisis. What could drive down the problem and the hundreds of vehicles just recovered? Plus, sacrificing everything to feed the hungry. These are some of the best people out there doing the most important work. Honoring the seven World Central Kitchen workers killed by Israel in Gaza. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. In Taiwan, rescuers worked through the night searching for survivors trapped by an earthquake, the strongest quake to hit that island in 25 years. Buildings shook just before 8 a.m. local time. It's believed about 100 people are trapped in buildings, tunnels and rock quarries. At least nine people are known to have died. Hundreds more are injured. Dozens are stranded by rock slides, including two Canadians. Earthquakes are common in Taiwan, and this news anchor took it in stride while on air. The studio lights dancing above her. Epicenter of the 7.4 magnitude quake is along Taiwan's mountainous east coast, 18 kilometers southwest of a busy tourist city. People there scrambled out of buildings that are left leaning precariously. This is Taiwan's capital, Taipei, where some rooftop pools were spilling onto the streets below. Nitu Garcha has our top story on the quake and the rescue. Footage from Taiwan's western Walian region shows the horror of the moment a multi-story building collapses onto a busy street. CCTV captures the chaos as dust fills the air and people scramble for safety. Our house is four stories uh, tall and it was... It was moving. It was it was shaking like it was badung, badung, badung. Raymond Buxton is a Canadian living in Taiwan. He and his family are safe, but shaken and devastated over the deaths and damage. I just hope that you know some peace for the families of the loved ones that are lost. Rescue operations are underway with firefighters and rescue crews risking their lives to save those trapped in the rubble. The devastation is clear as buildings lean precariously and landslides have destroyed the landscape. It's the largest earthquake since uh, in 25 years and the 1999 earthquake released about three times more energy than yesterday's earthquake. Taiwan lies along the Pacific Ring of Fire, where 80% of the world's largest earthquakes occur. The island is situated on the boundary between the Eurasian Sea Plate to the west and the Philippine Sea Plate to the east. The Philippine Plate is actively moving west, colliding with the Eurasian Plate and sliding under it, actively creating new mountains and lifting the surface of Taiwan. It's a very unique and very complex uh, tectonic setting. Uh, but similar in many ways to the west coast of Canada, where we have an ocean plate being pushed beneath North America. It's a terrible event for the affected people, but I think it's also a testament to the preparedness and the planning that's gone on in Taiwan over the last several decades that, that gives them a societal resilience to this type of earthquake. Taiwan's early warning system sent earthquake and tsunami alerts to phones seconds before the shaking started. They told us brace for shock and head for shelter. A similar system is set to launch in Canada next month. As Taiwan grapples with the fallout, the country's president is promising coordinated efforts to minimize the impact of the disaster and timely help to those who need it. Nitu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. Pressure is mounting on Israel after it killed aid workers in Gaza. The founder of the charity they worked for accuses Israel of using food as a weapon of war. These seven members of the World Central Kitchen died while delivering food to Palestinians, among them dual Canadian U.S. citizen Jacob Flickinger. The head of the charity says it was a direct attack by Israel on three clearly marked vehicles. That they were targeted systematically, car by car, uh, this happened over more than 1.5, 1.8 kilometers. So this was not just a bad luck situation where, oops, uh, we dropped the bomb in the wrong place or 
or no, this was a very defined humanitarian convoy that had signs in the top, in the roof, uh, a very colorful logo that we are obviously very proud of, but that, that's very clear who we are and what we do. But he also says their deaths were a direct result of Israel's policy to restrict humanitarian aid to Gaza. The only reason they were there is because food is so desperately needed. Crystal Gamansing reports. The bodies of the World Central Kitchen workers are on their way home. As ambulances headed towards the Egyptian border, other aid workers like Federico Desi mapped out how to proceed. It's the first time that uh, international aid workers are killed, and so for sure that has sent a shockwave across the community. Desi and his team postponed their work in central Gaza as it takes them on the same road where the Israeli strike killed the seven workers. Humanity and Inclusion does rehabilitation work with injured and disabled individuals and provides mobility devices. The needs are so catastrophic and uh, we can't fail the Palestinians. We need to, to keep on and continue supporting them. A GoFundMe page for Jacob Flickinger's young family says he arrived in Gaza in March ready to help. The retired member of the Canadian Armed Forces worked for WCK in Mexico as well. James Kirby's family says helping was also in his nature. They are heroes, all seven of them. But yeah, we're, we're a little bit um, unhappy with the, with the response from, from Israel, if I'm totally honest. The Israeli Prime Minister on Tuesday called the strike tragic, adding such things happen in war. By Wednesday morning, the IDF's chief of staff apologized. We are sorry for the unintentional harm to the members of WCK. We were targeted deliberately, nonstop, until everybody was dead in this convoy. A defined humanitarian convoy traveling on a defined humanitarian route. The founder of the charity is calling for a neutral investigation. This looks like it's not a war against terrorism anymore. Seems this is a war against humanity itself. To enhance protection for aid workers in Gaza and facilitate aid, Israel says it's opened a new humanitarian command center. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. In this country, former federal conservative party leader Aaron O'Toole says he's convinced foreign interference from the Chinese government led to the defeat of up to nine Tory candidates in the 2021 federal election. He doesn't believe that affected the overall outcome of the election. But during testimony at the inquiry into foreign interference today, O'Toole and others stressed government officials did not do enough to warn the public and federal parties about China's meddling. David Aiken reports. Aaron O'Toole says the Conservatives did not lose the 2019 election because of foreign interference by China, but some of his party's candidates did. Five to nine seats that I think were possibly changed as a result of foreign interference. One of those was in the Vancouver area riding of Steveston, Richmond East, where nearly half of voters are Chinese. Conservative Kenny Chu won there in 2019 but lost in 2021 after being the target of a massive coordinated disinformation campaign. Doors that have been opened to me mere 20 some months ago, uh, as soon as they, they heard my Chinese name, Zhao uh, Jingrong, they would shut the door in my face. Observe strong indicators. The disinformation campaign against Chu was flagged during the election period by Canadian security officials who concluded that there were, quote, strong indicators that the Chinese government was behind it. But no one told Chu or the Conservatives, and no one did anything about it. I've been betrayed. That's how I, I see it. Clearly, a genocide is taking place in Xinjiang. One reason why conservatives believe they were targeted by China, Michael Chong's motion to condemn China's persecution of Muslim Uyghurs as a genocide. In retaliation, Chinese diplomats in Canada plotted threats against his family. The federal government would end up expelling one of the diplomats involved. Chong, too, testified. I would say that the Conservative Party uh, was affected in about half a dozen ridings by the foreign interference threat activities directed by the government of the People's Republic of China. But the Prime Minister on Wednesday all but dismissed that testimony. 
I can understand where uh, someone who lost an election is trying to look for reasons uh, other than themselves why they might have lost an election. The reality is not a single riding or the result of the overall election was impacted or changed because of foreign interference. Now, that's been the Prime Minister's basic line all along, but the inquiry he called has appeared to have amassed enough evidence and testimony so far that it just might challenge the Prime Minister's hard and fast conclusion. Donna. All right, David in Ottawa, thanks. Other evidence came to light during yesterday's testimony of Toronto area MP Han Dong and whether he knowingly received support from China to help win the Liberal nomination and whether the Prime Minister will bring him back into the Liberal caucus. Dong was elected as a Liberal but left caucus over allegations China helped clinch his 2019 nomination. Dong denies the claims and is suing Chorus Entertainment, parent company of Global News, over the issue. A newly unsealed CSIS report alleges Chinese state actors may have organized the busing of international students to Dong's nomination vote. That allegation has not been proven and the CSIS report said the information is unsubstantiated. Dong has previously denied it. Has the People's Republic of China played a role in your nomination, your election, since you replaced Mr. Tang? Look, you know, I, I, the answer is no, absolutely not. During his testimony, he did reveal this. I was reminded recently uh, that um, by my wife that, you know, there was a bus um, came in with students. There was a bus coming with students? Oh, there was a bus, you know, with students coming in to vote. Okay. Dong said he presumed that bus had been organized by the school. Mercedes Stevenson is with me from Ottawa. Mercedes, what's the Prime Minister saying about whether Dong could return to the Liberal caucus? Donna, there was a marked change in the Prime Minister's tone when it came to Han Dong today. After vigorously defending his former Liberal caucus member, Trudeau would not comment on Dong, his future with the Liberal Party, or even say his name. The Prime Minister also refused to comment on an intelligence summary that had been submitted by Canada's spy agency CSIS to the Foreign Interference Inquiry. The document alleges an intercepted phone call between Dong and the Chinese consulate, where Dong allegedly states that even if the two Michaels were, be, were to be released in that moment, it would give ammunition to those who support a hardline policy on China, like opposition parties, and also advised Chinese officials on what would placate the Canadian public when it came to public opinion on the two Michaels and provide useful talking points for the Liberal Party. Dong says he's always advocated for the early release of the two Michaels and that he did not remember making the above statements and that they, quote, don't make a lot of sense. Global News twice asked the Prime Minister when he became aware of this CSIS summary and if it changed his opinion on Dong's future and possible return to the Liberal caucus. But all he would comment on was the importance of the inquiry and his own desire to testify. The ongoing uh, Foreign Interference Commission is an important way of highlighting uh, some of the challenges we face and some of the solutions that we've put forward to keep our democracy safe. Uh, and I look forward to being part of it. I will be testifying before the Commission uh, next week. In the past, Trudeau had provided a full-throated defense of Dong. One of the things we've seen, unfortunately, over the past years is a rise um, in uh, anti-Asian racism linked to the pandemic. Uh, and concerns being raised uh, or arisen uh, around uh, people's loyalties. I want to make everyone understand fully that Han Dong uh, is an outstanding member of our team and suggestions that uh, he is uh, somehow not loyal to Canada um, should not be entertained. Back in June, Dominic LeBlanc, a senior Liberal cabinet minister who is now the Minister of Public Safety, had said he was in talks with Dong about a potential return to caucus. The Prime Minister mentioned uh, to the caucus uh, last week that I would be working on a process with Mr. Dong uh, to decide uh, when, if and how he returns to caucus and that's the process that I'll be elaborating internally uh, within the government. Uh, and at the right moment with Mr. Dong over the number of weeks. So whether or not that potential return to caucus will still be in the cards is a mystery at this point. One thing is for sure, all eyes will be on the Prime Minister next week when he testifies. Donna? All right, Mercedes in Ottawa, thank you. Canada's stolen vehicle crisis coming up. How to put the brakes on car thieves.
Hundreds of stolen vehicles have been recovered after a crackdown in Ontario and Quebec. Since December, Ontario Provincial Police and the Canada Border Services Agency say they've searched 390 shipping containers and seized almost 600 stolen vehicles that were about to be shipped out of Montreal. Eric Sorensen looks at what's driving these crimes and the strategy to stop them. Every five minutes, a car in Canada is stolen. The numbers have spiked, up 48% in Ontario in 2022, as organized crime targets high-end vehicles for export. Many end up in containers to be shipped illegally through the Port of Montreal. Police and border services are fighting back, today showing off some of the hundreds of vehicles recovered in just the last four months. Crisis, uh, epidemic, uh, it is a significant uh, challenge for for uh, not just Ontario and Quebec, but, but our country. And says the OPP Deputy Commissioner, there is the economic impact and the safety risk to police and the public. The risk to public citizens, you know, the home, violent home invasions, carjackings, significant. Most of the cars stolen and recovered are from the greater Toronto area, plus Ottawa, Hamilton, Niagara, Waterloo and other regions. In all, Project Vector recovered 483 cars in Ontario, plus 115 more in Quebec. $34.5 million worth before they could be shipped to cities all over the world. Today was a big hit um, out of the pockets of the organized crime groups that are responsible for these, and we're not done. They're a long way from being done. While some 400 containers were searched, 1.5 million containers go through Montreal annually. Canadian Border Services says an additional 300 vehicles shipped by rail from the Toronto area were intercepted. The CBSA is conducting its own targeting in the Port of Montreal, in Toronto rail yards and even in the Port of Vancouver. Ottawa convened a summit in February earmarking $28 million to tackle the crisis. Thieves are able to clone key fobs and reprogram computers, making even the newest models quick and easy targets. The insurance industry says more must be done. Not an easy feat, but uh, something that we're working with manufacturers, working with Transport Canada, working with our international partners to identify what other countries have had success. Making the vehicles more uh, fortified to be able to uh, be harder to steal is the ultimate goal. There is incentive to do more. Last year, Ontario for the first time topped a billion dollars in auto theft claims. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, NATO's plan for long-term military aid to Ukraine. NATO foreign ministers met in Brussels today, trying to find a way to move away from short-term support for Ukraine towards longer-term military assistance. They agreed to plan for a multi-billion dollar aid package. The details will take shape in the weeks to come. But make no mistake, Ukraine can rely on NATO support now and for the long haul. NATO Secretary General put forward a proposal to create a $107 billion fund over five years. The plan is for NATO to have a more direct role in coordinating the supply of arms, ammunition and equipment to Ukraine, taking over some of the work a U.S.-led coalition is responsible for now. And into a third year of war with Russia, Ukraine's president has signed a bill lowering the minimum age for conscription from 27 to 25. In the first weeks after the invasion, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians volunteered to serve. Many of those people are dead, wounded or simply exhausted, and the army needs new recruits to fill the ranks. Showing up to feed strangers next, why the world needs humanitarian workers. Where would the world be without the helpers, the humanitarians who give their time, their energy, and sometimes their lives to help others? The charity called the World Central Kitchen was in Gaza because Israel is restricting deliveries of food and famine is setting in. Its work is based on the simple belief that food is a universal human right. It served 43 million meals in Gaza, and then Israel killed seven of its workers. As Heather Urex West reports, its founder says he believes Israel is better than the way this war is being waged. In the worst conditions you can imagine, the best of humanity shows up. Words written by World Kitchen founder Jose Andres in the New York Times Wednesday, two days after seven of the charity's workers were killed in Gaza by an Israeli airstrike. They are not faceless or nameless, he writes. They are not generic aid workers or collateral damage in war. They had come from all over the world to help. 
A dual Canada-U.S. citizen, Jacob Flickinger was a retired member of the Canadian Armed Forces who had served in Afghanistan. He leaves behind a young family with a one-year-old son. James Kirby, John Chapman, and James Henderson were all former soldiers in the British military who also worked as private security contractors. All highly trained, highly professional, and a truly tragic loss to both us and indeed their loved ones. Hey, this is Zomi and Shepard. Australian aid worker Zomi Frankham had previously delivered aid in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Haiti before her time in Gaza. Friends calling the 43-year-old a humanitarian hero. There's no words. You know, these are some of the best people out there doing the most important work. And people like Zomi are so selfless and only doing what they do because of their love for humanity. Oh, 35-year-old Damien Sobol of Poland and 25-year-old Saifedin Issam Ayed Abu Taha also died trying to deliver food to a population threatened by both war and hunger. Humanitarians and civilians should never be paying the consequences of war. This is a basic principle of humanity. Jose Andres closed his New York Times piece with a final message about the lives lost. It is not a sign of weakness to feed strangers. It is a sign of strength. The people of Israel need to remember at this darkest hour what strength truly looks like. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Yubo, British Columbia. Thanks for watching and hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye bye.